I'm uh, Paul Nunn. To give you some, some background, uh, like, um, like I was introduced, I, I was formerly Managing Director at Outfit7, which gives me a good overview of a lot of the challenges that you guys are facing, because we were a large developer and um, we had all of uh, the issues that came in in terms of copper compliance and social media for kids that I'm going to be talking about today. That was very much what we had to go through ourselves. So uh, hopefully I have a good overview of it. My most uh, the most up-to-date information is that I'm Chief Commercial Officer at Super Awesome. Don't bother reading any of this, but the key to it is that Super Awesome is a business that was established about three years ago to solve issues in the kids space. And there are issues. There are big issues that are required um, to work in the kids space, and it's a very different place to the, to the over-13 market, as, as a lot of the discussion has focused on today. Um, what, we've, uh, what we started out with was we built an ad server, which was specifically for the kids market, so it was copper compliant, doesn't hold any data in it, protects you if you want to work in a kids-safe environment, um, since, since then, we've rolled out services to help um, brands and uh, producers of kids, kids products to, to operate in the world, to open up stuff. Mainly, mainly, this covers three kind of areas. First of all is monetization. We've heard a lot that there are challenges in terms of monetization when you operate in a kid's in a kids' market, in a kids' marketplace, lots of stuff is closed off from you. Um, the second one is social, which we'll be talking about today, uh, and the last one is kind of content and product. So, um, how do you build a product with with copper compliance in mind? How do you ensure that you're protected? Those kind of things. So, all those areas are the areas that Super Awesome exists in. Um, we have a large company now, a lot of people there, over a hundred, um, a lot of people involved in the technology, the advertising, and the marketing specialisms that would go into making that a service available to everyone. So, today I get the the opportunity to talk about kids and social media. Media. Obviously, the easiest topic in the world, uh, not. It's the worst, actually, because those two things should not mix at all um, in, in terms of mainstream social at the moment. Um, I wanted to cover four areas very briefly. I've got loads of slides, so I need to rattle through them. I want to talk very fast. Uh, first of all, is some context. So what's the context and background to kids and social media? Where, where are we now? Uh, the next is to give some practical inputs. I always like presentations when there's some actual stuff that I should be trying to do myself that I can take out from there. Where they're by no means it's a, a, a experts here in terms of a, the situation. It's always changing and evolving, but hopefully some input. Um, and then some imp insights from us uh, as, as people who have run a social network for kids and are managing something now which is involved with kids. What do we see? Know your audience. How can you work with kids a little bit closer? And then lastly, um, what constitutes a social media for kids? Because it is slightly different to what you would consider social media, I think. Um, and, and we manage a platform, so I can talk about that. So first of all, some context. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this. Kids um, and mobile devices and digital, um, I think the two are in, innately connected. Kids, every generation that passes, more and more connected. Um, my son, um, anyone who's got kids knows that their son or their daughter will start swiping the television because it doesn't work properly. Um, everyone in, 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 in the world who has been around children nowadays knows they are digital natives. They don't know anything different. They don't see the walls between ecosystems and platforms like we do. Uh, and they're extremely tech savvy from day one all the way through. Most of the, the kids who are 10 years old and watching videos on YouTube have kind of been interacting with digital devices for at least seven or eight years now. So they're way more veteran than we are um, when it comes to this stuff. Um, and the second part of the context is that every social media platform in the world that has any kind of scale is for 13 plus. Very deliberately, because otherwise, um, as Shai and the guys just discussed, copper compliance and the upcoming GDPR rules that are going to govern in Europe, um, <clears throat> and now the rollout of this potentially globally, is going to see that all social media are in big, big trouble, because social media is data. That is what social media is. It's literally every piece of data about you um, providing a context, a background, and allowing them to behaviorally target you and find out more of what you want, serve you exactly what content and ads and everything else that you like. Um, <clears throat> this is actually what Copper and GDPR are. They're a gray area. They're not black and white. They're a gray area of interpretation, uh, hundreds of lawyers um, obsessing over the document and trying to figure out where is the good and the bad and what can you do and what can't you do when it comes to a digital ecosystem that grows and expands and gets ever more complicated day by day by day. So it's very difficult. It's going to roll out over time and it's going to be uh, a process. But what's happening now is that process has started. So uh, Copper and GDPR, to a certain extent, coming in are no longer this kind of hazy, distant uh, threat or opportunity, considering which way you look at it, they're now current. They're, they're finding people for this. Big kids brands in Mobi, uh, on the ad tech side, but a lot of, a lot of people are being fined now. Uh, and the, the black and white are being separated out. 
Copper compliance is uh, for hard black text on slides because it's a serious matter. So that's what I've done. Uh, here is a list of some of the recent copper rulings. Don't have to read all of them, but some of them are there. This is just the interpretation of what has come out from the uh, New York State Attorney coming out and saying, right, this is what we're going to find people for. So incorrect configuration of ad service, which is scary because it's, it's just a mistake, but it could cost your business. Uh, insufficient disclosure of data collection, ineffective due diligence on third-party trackers. And then the one we're interested in today, which is the assumption is debunked that social media plugins can be used for under 13 sites. Social media is for plus 13s. If you use it in, a, in an under 13 site, then you're going to be in trouble sooner or later. Um, three extra bonus ones that came out of it, just in case you thought you could head your, hide your head in the sand and run away from this. First of all, there's a subjective determination of to whether products are child-directed, so it's based on your content. If, you, if you're denying that you have a kid's audience and you have loads of content which is animated characters and you know there are actually kids there, then you're in trouble. Um, highlights that mixed age sites are subject to copper. So this general kind of, my app is open to the whole world and whoever uses it, it's up to them. If you're making a, an app about a cartoon character which is directly aimed, directly aimed at kids, no, 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 definitely it's on context. And it explicitly determines that you're responsible as the publisher. So it's definitely for you to decide uh, what you do in this and you're going to be held responsible for all of the third-party trackers and everything else. So that's quite scary, but not too bad, hopefully. So now we go to the practical input. So <clears throat> first thing is, don't do this. Don't hide your head in the sand and go, la, 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 hope it never comes back and haunts you and say, I don't even want to know about this because it sounds like a world of pain. Don't do that because lots of people are doing that and gradually they'll be weeded out. Um, if you're unlucky, then you'll be very quickly weeded out at the moment. The next one is privacy laws are not set out to ruin businesses. You know, the FTC is not trying to make it impossible to do business um, if you're a kid's targeted app or game or uh, anything like that. What they're trying to do is to make sure that you follow the right rules and you do it in the right way, which is sometimes painful and hard, but they're still what, that's still the game. It's not, the aim is not to put people out of business, and the world is adapting around these rules. So you have companies like ours that are growing up. There's lots of other companies around here that have spoken. You have safe harbor programs like Shy who are coming in out of the woodwork now and are enabling people to do business and trying to push the legislation in the right direction so it does enable that. Um, a general audience does still exist, so it's not like now your app is open to the world and suddenly you get a load of kids users, there's a responsibility to acknowledge them, and your life is only difficult. Context is used, yes, so context is used, but general apps still, still are available to you. You just have to follow certain rules and be careful about how you engage in those areas. Um, <clears throat> my next point would be to just investigate this area. Take your head out the sand. <clears throat> Consider a safe harbor program. The safe harbor program blew up a few years ago. Uh, never been more apparent the need for that program. Uh, first of all, it takes responsibility off you, so you take your liability away. If you notice that Hasbro in the recent rulings were the one that didn't get fined out of the collection of media owners that uh, had an impropriety uh, according to Copex because they have a safe harbor program. The others don't. So that gives you a liability um, a risk uh, offset onto them. But secondly, it just means you're going to have to deal with, with them on these copper issues, and they're going to run a lot of rigor, and you're going to understand a lot more than when you did deal with them. So it's just important to get your head out and, and speak to those guys. <clears throat> this is the most important one. Look at every single third-party link on your site app game because every single one of those is you're being judged by. Um, it's, you need guarantees from partners, and this is the real test. If they're willing to give you a written guarantee that copper is being upheld on their end, then you're fine um, to a certain extent. But you're still responsible, but hopefully that means that the big people will be weeded out from the ones who are just uh, paying lip service to copper. Um, and it's not just ads. It's everyone. So this is relevant for the, for the social media link again. Um, Make an effort, effort to segregate your audience. This is the most difficult one. Um, certainly, this is one of the prime areas um, that, that copper is going to have to be translated into mainstream, uh, the mainstream world. At the moment, you have um, age gating in apps, which is a kind of passive way to do it. But segregating your audience if you're a general vehicle is definitely going to happen, and it's coming uh, very soon, and you should all be doing it almost now. And effort is everything here. So you, the, the scene to be making an effort to segregate your audience, although it means you have a liability to protect those under 13, it, it's everything and the key to doing this. Um, and then the last one, do not direct your kids' audience to areas they should not be. Very basic. If you have an under-13 audience or they've gone through the age gate and they're under-13, then you shouldn't be directing them to Facebook or Twitter or any of those social medias that are for, the, for places that they shouldn't be across the board. Um, alternatives are growing, and there will be more opportunity for you to find other places. Um, oh, this is the last one. Um, 
it is an opportunity for you to uh, involve the parent in the conversation. So certainly um, there's lots of issues that come with segregating your audience and treating the two different seg uh, segregated groups differently. But there is a huge opportunity for a kid's brand now to engage with the parent as well as just the child. And then the restrictions are slightly relaxed and you have then in your conversation, you have the parent who is the one who is likely to be spending the money in your product. Um, <clears throat> and also <clears throat> there is a prevailing attitude that parental verification and things like that are all or nothing. Either you have an app that has <clears throat> parental verification at the heart and you deal with the parent and that's a lot of preschool brands and then, and then you're in a subscriber model, those kind of things. It doesn't have to be like that. What you can have is a system where you build an app and then certain areas are restricted until you get verification. It, needs to be, it can be worked into the product in a progressive way and not just a decision you make on day one whether your product's going to be verified by the parent and targeted them or targeted to the child. Um, I'm completely wrong. There are loads of these. Um, first of all, uh, last one is you test safe kids' social opportunities because they are there. Uh, I'm going to talk about one. Um, so obviously, it's my, in my interest to say that. But I would say that one thing you do have to bear in mind is that kids' safe social is going to be slightly different to adult social. It's not going to be a global one-stop shop that pervades everywhere like a Facebook or Instagram. But it will build up over time, and you'll have more opportunities to engage with kids safely in a social environment. Um, so now you know your audience. So our audience today is kids. Um, kids are a lot like these guys. Uh, if you've worked in a kid's product, then you know this to be true. Um, they have a deep product knowledge. They will test every access point. They'll try and break everything. They'll, they'll understand every detail of your product better than even you do. And they'll exploit all of the flaws in it and, and, and speak and chat about all of the mistakes and all the errors in it. Um, they demand freedom. If you try to take freedom away from them in a kid's environment, you, sh you restrict the words that they can use in chat. For example, they re they'll rebel against that and they'll hate that. And suddenly you'll have a situation where um, you, you go into a running battle with the kids and it becomes an engagement of enemies. Uh, and you'll have a situation where they try to put their Skype address in your, uh, in, in your message chatbot. Uh, you say that you don't want their address because it's personally identified information, so you cut off the word Skype. So then they'll start using Skype. And then you'll cut off sky. And then they can no longer say the sky is blue. And you'll start cutting off. So you don't want to get into a war with them. You need to work with these people. Uh, otherwise, you'll be dead in the water. Um, they're extremely resourceful. So you'll see them use all of the resources at their disposal. And they'll do things that you never thought possible uh, in your product. Um, and suddenly, you'll see things like we see, um, the re we see messaging going through, sharing personal information, stuff like that, stuff they shouldn't do in the reviews that are on the App Store. So they're out of our product and out of our control. But they'll, they'll start doing that. It's uh, insane. Um, they're extremely tech and social aware. So the awareness that we have in our users is extreme. This is actually a good one. Um, what we see at the moment is that we operate a social platform for kids 7 to 12 years old, which is, leads into mainstream social media. We see a lot that kids know exactly that it's made for them. Uh, and then when they move into, out of PopJam, and, which is our app and our um, social platform, and into mainstream social media, they come back because they don't enjoy the environment of being in the adult world. They don't like it. They're very savvy about what the, wor the world that exists. And then they cannot be lost. Um, this is something that's come through that I just found extremely funny. Um, kids nowadays have a yearning, and in our app they, and in our social platform, we see a lot of content generated about being lost because kids don't know how to be lost anymore. They've always got a device on them that's got social, uh, it's got social links and it's got Google Maps, uh, and they never know. The feeling of being lost is something which is completely foreign to them, and they kind of yearn to have that kind of unexplored journey thing, uh, which is just interesting. Uh, and then lastly, the section here is what constitutes social for kids? This is something we should know a lot about because we, we own and run a, a social platform for kids, which is called PopJam. Um, the first thing is that this needs to be your audience. So if you see the spike at 10 years old, 32% of the audience on PopJam is 10 years old. This is exactly the audience <clears throat> that should be in social media, we feel. <clears throat> this is exactly the audience which is underserved in the environment that we live in today because they've come out of the preschool areas and there's loads of great preschool products um, in the market and they've come into a zone where most people just put their fingers in the ears and it depends on how strict your parent is as to whether or not you're in Instagram yet. These are these guys. So this is where the world exists. I think Shai's point in the last presentation about a viable alternative. Never has there been a truer case than in social media um, where a viable alternative is what we seek to provide. Um, you need a feed. So same as Instagram or any of a mainstream social, you need a feed of content that is constantly updated and is filled in by the brands and the people that are around you that you, that you love and you care about. 
Um, you need a discover tab in our case. So you need an access point for um, brands that kids love to interact with those kids and for kids to find new stuff to follow and to see new content. Uh, you need alerts. Kids are crazy on alerts. So when you open up your Facebook page and you've got 10 uh, notifications, kids live off of those. So we call them alerts in Pop Jam. Um, there are hundreds. Of, they're much, 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 much keener to like and share stuff. So you'll see if you work on Pop Jam at any point, then you'll see that you have hundreds of alerts and everyone loves those. Um, and then you have a profile. So your profile very much is your social, uh, your social interaction with others. And particularly um, for Pop Jam, it's about levels and tags and gamification and uh, finding kind of uh, unique things that you can post and collecting your, your friends that you love the most so that you can make a social unit on Pop Jam. Um, we also uh, have video. So video is a huge, huge uh, ecosystem thing for, these, for this generation. Video is their dominant media. So we have a, a copper compliant video player which we built ourselves. So that's built in app, um, not using any other services. Um, and then this is the, probably the biggest thing that's different in social media for kids. Uh, they want to create stuff. They don't just want to view stuff. It's not a channel of stuff that they're, they're, they're broadcast, being broadcast to them. They actually want to do, draw stuff and do stuff. So in Pop Jam, there's a, a drawing tool, and kids create lots of stuff. Um, go into Pop Jam. Try and draw these. You won't be able to. These are amazing. Uh, I don't know how the kids do it. I think it's because they've got much smaller fingers than me. Um, there's tons of art. Um, there were 15 million creations like this in Pop Jam uh, in, the last year, in the last year, so since January this year. 15 million. I just showed you 40. That's quite a lot. Of images. 15 million is a great deal more. Um, so that's overwhelmingly what kids want to do. They want to create stuff and they want to share it. Um, the other thing you need is you need big brands that they love. So on Pop Jam, we have channels for Nintendo, for My Little Pony, for, for Disney, and they're the places that, that, um, that the kids spend time. They're the brands that people want to see, that the kids want to see updated. Um, just to give some vindication to our audience, with these are stats from, from Disney XD. So they launched a channel on Pop Jam. Uh, they launched an Instagram uh, account for Disney XD. They launched the Instagram account many months before uh, the Pop Jam feed. And as you can see, the growth in those two in terms of followers um, demonstrates that where they should be is on, an, on a platform which is designed for the audience which Disney XD serves. Um, the other big shift that we've seen, in, in, I would say, in the last six months is that YouTubers and influencers on that platform are now straying over um, to, uh, to Pop Jam. Amy Lee 33, who's on that slide uh, down the bottom, she's a big YouTuber, over a million subscribers. I had a meeting with her when we were first talking about Pop Jam for her through Maker Studios, her representative. I expected her to come into our office and for me to try and persuade her to come onto Pop Jam. She ended up deluging with me with so many questions about kids' online privacy and safety. Uh, she was uh, worse than shy, actually, in terms of those questions. So what there is now is there's a social consciousness coming through um, YouTubers and people who, who have an audience of kids that they want to know more and they, have a, uh, they, need, they want to use their power for good. So we've been using that a lot and working with a lot of YouTubers on, on Pop Jam. Um, the last piece is moderation. So if you want to run a kid's social network and you want a social media piece, then moderation is, is the buzzword. It's the big, huge barrier that sits in front of you um, because really it's a huge, huge thing to deal with. Um, in, our, um, in our kind of uh, opinion, um, it's a very much a layered process about lots of different stuff. So we monitor everything on Pop Jam. So we have advanced moderation technology. We use trust scores. Every person who comes into Pop Jam uh, gets a trust score they don't know about. We judge them based on their actions, and we, we put them in categories of risk in terms of their behavior. We have OCR and facial recognition. So we, we pick up through technology all of the handwriting in Pop Jam and all of the faces to make sure there are no selfies on the platform. So we protect kids via that. Um, and then we have a human moderation team. There's no getting around it. We have 10, per, 10 people plus who literally review any gray area stuff that comes through Pop Jam to make sure it's appropriate. And then those guys have over 20 years experience in this, in this world. They have all the escalation procedures, all of the correct ways for dealing with kids if they come through your, through your app or your product. Uh, and then lastly, we have copper compliance. Again, th that comes with building the technology from the ground up to, to surface the node data um, to the user. And then the second piece, which is actually more important for us at Pop Jam, um, is community. So we want to create a community atmosphere on Pop Jam, which is very important when you're dealing with kids of this age in their informative stages. We can't just ban people from the platform. How does that serve anyone? We need to have corrective behavior to tell them what they did wrong and try and bring them back into the community. So first of all, there's no private chat in Pop Jam. Everything is completely open. Um, so that everyone can jump in and see it. Um, 50 followers to upload photos is very interesting. So we make users become part of the community and get 50 followers, which is not easy to do, before you have access to, 
to, to the opportunity to upload your own content. That puts you in a much lower category in terms of whether you're going to do something wrong, basically, because you've invested in getting those followers. Uh, there are no selfies on, on the app. Um, quite unusually for an app, it has closing hours. So when you go into Pop Jam and it's ele after 11 p.m., you should be in bed. Uh, so we don't allow you to, to do anything and create anything. Um, those two things, 50 followers to upload a photo and closing hours, are the two things that kids moan about the most. Uh, and private chat, actually. They moan about all of this. Uh, but we don't, we don't listen, and we, we, we think this is probably best for them. Um, the last piece is staff are on the platform. There's always an adult in the room in terms of uh, the engagements on Pop Jam. And then the biggest part for community is it's about challenges and rewards. You know, very different to adult social media. These are kids. We issue daily challenges every day, draw on this. We encourage all of our brands and people that work on Pop Jam to do stuff and encourage kids and then they get rewarded with likes from that brand or highlighted on the Hall of Fame channel where lots of those images came from that you saw. So that's kind of the community element. Um, this is kind of a summary of, of how dealing with kids on, in, on social media is different from dealing with adults. Um, what we see loads and loads on Pop Jam is role play. So kids will create a character and then they'll uh, use that character in different role plays. They'll emerge through their lives. They'll interact with different characters they've created and their friends' characters and wolves. Kids loved wolves. So uh, what we did is we proactively threw some toys into the sandbox. Um, what we saw was that kids, when they made these drawings of wolves, sometimes would put them in bikinis or do stuff that was kind of not quite appropriate. So we said, right, we'll make the wolves and you can play with them. So we created loads of stickers of these different kinds of wolves, all different characters that kids would identify with. We threw them into Pop Jam in loads of positions and stances, and now the kids are using those to, to do role play back and forth. So we are controlling the conversation a little bit more. Um, and we called them the Rainbow Space Wolves. Uh, which is just cool, uh, and the kids have gone crazy over that. So now we see tons of content generated from these characters, and we're kind of helping the conversation along in the right way, we would say. Um, so what's next? Um, we would say um, this, this section is kind of what's next for Pop Jam, but I would say it's also what's next for the industry in terms of kids' social, and I'll come to that at the end. So at the moment, we have an amazing ecosystem which is built in our app. So we have, a, we have a, an app which is uh, safe in a walled garden, and we have lots of great brands interacting from Disney to Nintendo to the rest. What the next step is, well, what the, what the issues that are solved by that are, it gives brands access to social content. It gives uh, brands uh, opportunities to have interactive content to directly have a conversation with kids and build up loads of stuff. When a brand comes into Pop Jam, they immediately get tons of art created for their brand. It's a really good engagement two-way. Um, what you saw with mainstream social media, actually, was that it starts with an app or a website, and it kind of builds out and then suddenly spreads its webs and tentacles into the web. So you suddenly see YouTube embedded videos all over the place. You suddenly see Facebook embeds all over the place. You see social interactions through Twitter feeds and things embedded across a number of sites and apps. That's going to be more difficult, but we think that's what we can do with Pop Jam. So definitely there's, there are challenges in terms of technology, uh, in terms of copper and other things in the kids space, but we're uniquely positioned, we feel, to roll out our kids' social layer. Um, so that's what Pop Jam is going to become. It's going to become a platform. Um, what we see here is, uh, and this is already in beta, so we already have five or six partners, uh, big names in the kids space, who are going to pull the content feed which is created in Pop Jam and place it into their products, so their website, their app. This is going to give them a rolling feed um, of, of really cool interactive content, social content that kids are producing around their brand and put it into one of their environments. So it's going to try and create this social layer and an ecosystem which will allow everyone to, to benefit from social. Um, and we see this getting bigger and bigger. So the next round of this will take on more partners. And we already see that this, this kind of the opportunity exists in Kids for Social to create a, a network, an ecosystem of copper compliant, safe, fun destination for kids that are linked together via a social tissue. And we think that there's an opportunity for us to, do, to start that process, at least, with the way that the Pop Jam platform will evolve. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Any questions? I was... Wondering if you have ever considered what happens to the kids when they grow up. What I mean is that Facebook is for a lifetime. It's from 13 until you die. Yeah. Uh, um, and this, you get too old for this. Yeah. And it's, it's painful to leave your social network because you invest a lot in it. Yeah, yeah. So is, have you ever thought of what to do with the kids that, 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 that grow up? It's an interesting point. Um, I think most of the art probably can be transferred in one way or another. We actually see the reverse of that. Kids are pretty much uh, transient in the way that they move around social media. So, for example, stuff that they created yesterday they love, they don't like it anymore, they don't keep it in a gallery. Very much their, their profile is a window into what is cool for them right at that very moment. 
So a couple of points on that. Um, we definitely see Pop Jam as a transition phase. There's no way that we, we're going to position Pop Jam as up against Instagram and Snapchat and the rest. We definitely think that there's room for a graduation from that into the, into the mainstream services. And what actually we see is the reverse. So we see at the moment, what, what we're doing at the moment, one of the product features which is rolling out very soon is leveling. So you can level up in terms of the badges you've collected. We definitely need to do that because kids are um, using Pop Jam as a game and then resetting. So at the moment, you have a system where you generate different stars throughout your life on, on Pop Jam. And the ultimate goal is to be a neon star. And a neon star is like a top Pop Jammer. We literally, as, as an organization, have rewarded you, the user, and said, you're one of the best Pop Jammers. And usually, um, that comes after 1,000 followers, 1,000 followers. Um, so what, what kids are now doing is that they're going all the way to Neon Star and then they're setting up another account <laughs> and they're leaving the old one and they're trying to do it all again. So th th it's almost a game, the whole process of doing that. So there isn't that kind of legacy, oh my God, all my photos are in Facebook. What do I do now? How do I pass them on to my kids? Nothing like that at all. It's very much seen as something which is going to change tomorrow and the day after and the day after. What is the size of your auditory? What's the number so of users? So Pop Jam users? specifically. Mm -hmm. So Pop Jam specifically is only existing in the UK up to a couple of months ago. Um, in the UK over the last one and a bit years, um, nearly one and a half, it's generated 1.4 million registered users. Um, the monthly audience base at the center of that, now we've actually opened up to the US market, is around about the 200,000 mark monthly users. Um, but the platform pieces, it changes that radically, obviously, because it, we, what we had as, as, as partners on this, so the Disneys and the Hasbros and the rest of our partners, we have kind of bought into this social piece with them because they're, they're actually engaged in creating tons of content for Pop Jam. So the platform piece is as much a demand from them to use the content elsewhere. And, and that kind of next stage of, of development in terms of the platform will leap the numbers up in terms of the available audience for the content, which has kind of been our view on it the whole time. So Pop Jam is actually an acquisition. The the product, the central product was built by Mind Candy originally. Um, but our transition of it definitely was we saw it as a social content layer for kids that could uh, link a lot of different brands and sites and products together. So that development will be the, where the bigger numbers come, we would say. And did I get you right uh, that if I am a kid from Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. I won't be able to re re register to login? In yeah, so, so at, the, at the moment, so the platform piece will open that up because you will have sites and apps that have audiences in different geographies. That will definitely open it up. But th absolutely, the central product underneath um, Pop Jam is English language and it's been based in the US, uh, in UK and now in the US. Um, there are tons of complexities to adding languages based on the moderation that we have to do and the protection we put in there. So definitely the platform piece is about broadcast more, a lot of the phase one of the, the platform is to broadcast that content into a wider area. So in short, to your answer, kids in Eastern Europe will be able to see the content, I'm sure, in the next six months, but getting a fully built out service that allows them to build profiles and for us to protect them when they do that is slightly further down the line. But we do see geograph but, geography but, but as a big do, expansion point. Do you mean that the localizations are the only reasons? So Lo but did I get it right? Yeah, localizing the infrastructure of Pop Jam and the moderation. We've got human moderators ah, uh, and stuff like that, yeah. So the technology is kind of key. This is one of the issues that um, is technology is finding a way to do this. So what we see every, every, every few months is that there's more technology for us to allow um, more flexibility in terms of moderation for language. So Google Translate, other things are popping up that are going to make it in the future a lot easier to police this, this kind of domain. But to give... 100% certainty on a lot of this stuff. There's still a human at the end of a lot of this stuff, and that's a, a big barrier to adding language very quickly. Thank you. All done. Thanks. <laughs>